17,000 years ago, our Paleolithic ancestors were in a cave in France and they enacted a ritual created from the mythology of dragon slaying. How do we know this? Well, because within two caves in the south of France, we have found evidence of this ritual. And this video is the story and research of how we know this and a fascinating journey through the mythology and archaeology that proves it. And so, if you're interested in dragon slaying, or warrior horses, or headless animals, or even a 17,000 year old myth, then grab yourself a cup of tea and welcome to Crackenford. Hello, I'm John White, a specialist in Indo European mythology, and our journey starts with the skeletons of two snakes found in separate caves of the Pyrenees Mountains in southern France. The caves are called Montespan and Le Tuc de Audebourg, and these caves have a few things in common. Both were quite deep, both had rivers associated with them, both showed evidence of being inhabited by Homo sapiens in the Paleolithic period, but most interesting of all to us is that in both caves a skeleton of a snake was found in good condition, but both with a striking exception, a rather unique feature, as both were without their heads. The cave at Les Touques de Audebourg is well known for the artwork that Paleolithic man left within it, alongside the wealth of footprints on the clay floor left 17,000 years ago, some of which were around the broken skull of a cave bear. And we have on the walls of this cave many drawings of horses, bison and other animals but perhaps what the cave is most famous for are the representations of two bison created around 17,000 years ago by our ancestors on the clay floor of that cave. And if we look at the other cave, the Montespan cave, there we find another clay sculpture, that of a cave bear, and which is around 4 feet or 1.2 metres in length. But this bear has an interesting feature, as it was made without its head. It was headless. Now, I will look into the archaeological finds within these and other caves in the region in more detail later in this video. But to justify looking into this, we need to consider all this activity by the Paleolithic people who inhabited these caves and then consider the information we know about the snakes that were found. And with this, it allows us to form an interesting hypothesis. You see, for a snake to be that far within a cave, which was around 150 metres or about close to 500 feet from the entrance, it almost certainly must have been placed there. For there are very few examples of snakes living in caves, let alone inhabiting so far into a cave. And if we add to this the consideration that the snake's body was so well preserved, all of its bones or their bones of its body were still connected, obviously with the exception of the head, suggesting that it was not prey or that it was not caught by an animal to be eaten. Otherwise, we would expect to see the skeleton damaged along its body where it was attacked. And to this, we remember that just the heads were removed with no other damage to the rest of the snake's body, which suggests the removal of the head was deliberate, but with an amount of care. And finally, if we observe the scene, we see that both of these snakes lay near clay animals that have been modelled by those same Paleolithic human hands that may have killed the snake, as well as one of the snakes was actually placed in the centre of a gower, which is a natural pool of water that forms within a cave. And so if we put this information together, then we can form the hypothesis that these snakes didn't get to these places by their own making and that they were not taken there by a carnivorous predator, but instead that they were placed there deliberately, either being decapitated there or close to the cave before being brought inside. And this helps us come to the conclusion that this was all part of a ritual. Now, like most things I teach, there will be some of you who say that what we have here, with two snakes found like this, 
is just a coincidence. But to me, this seems unlikely considering the cave was inhabited at the time the snake was deposited within it. And so humans would not have let a random dead snake just lay in the cave. And then if we couple this with the fact that both caves had rivers coming out of them and that the snake skeletons were found close to artificially shaped clay and that the snakes were in good condition but both without their heads, then the chances of this being a coincidence is incredibly small. And so I will proceed with the confidence that this wasn't a coincidence. Now, another reason for considering this is a ritual is because the snakes were in great condition but headless, a form of snake acephaly, if you will. But is there any further evidence to support this claim of ritual? And so which will allow us to understand what exactly is going on here? Well, it could be argued that the snakes of these caves were harmless snakes, which the Paleolithic peoples would have been aware of if they were. But if this was the case, then why take their heads off? Why do it deep within a cave, a cave with a river, and then to leave the rest of the snake's body intact? Well, the answer to this is that the snake was seen as a symbol by men to refer to something else through its resemblance or association and that to behead it and leave it at the back of a cave was this ritual act. But to also prove this was a ritual act, we must reconstruct what was happening here. And to do that, we must first accept that Paleolithic ritual and mythology are linked. And if we can do this, then we could try to reconstruct the way people thought at the time and the perception they had of snakes. And as a ritual doesn't make myth, but myth informs ritual, then it would be necessary to accept the hypothesis that myth was the source of the ritual. And so to better understand what I mean, let me tell you an example of this in a better attested culture with an example of the ancient Greeks who explained the origin of a cult through an etiological myth, a myth where the cause is known. And here we can use the example of the Athenian festival of the Apatores, where the Ephibes sacrificed their hair to commemorate the deception used by the Athenian Menantheos by cutting his hair and so who triumphed over his opponent which is a clear example of a ritual act to recognise the mythology. And this is an important point about belief in ritual. And so in culture, and so in primitive beliefs, these rituals, the ceremonies around them, the customs of the cultures and society, some of them at times have direct references to myth or are regarded as results of mythical events. We can also... Uh, see examples of this in, in Christianity, uh, which has ceremonies based on fixed rituals fashioned by mythology, from the Holy Communion with the bread and the wine, and Easter with the cross and celebrating resurrection, we see rituals and symbolism formed from these myths. And so this is why we should have confidence to assume that the mythology shaped the ritual we see in the scenes within these caves. And so let's look at the impact of the Paleolithic mythology on this scene. And we can do this using a process called phylogenetics, which is the use of statistical probability of myth dispersal and development mapped against or alongside human migrations, coupled with any other evidence, to find the probability of a myth occurring somewhere when that myth would have been at the location and what that myth was about, its key motifs. And so using this process would allow us to see if there were myths concerning dragons in this region of southern France during the Paleolithic period. And if so, what these myths were and whether, if we can recreate the mythology, whether we can apply them to this dragon ritual. Now, the data for this analysis is sourced from a number of corpora, including the Arna Thompson Uther Index 
and Bereskin's database. And some of data of these can be found on the Crackenfold website at crackenfold.com. But what can't be found on there is the like and subscribe buttons, which can be found down here somewhere and should be pressed if you like drinking tea or Dragon Slam. Thank you. Now, if we get back to the academia, the analysis looked at 42 different mythological narratives over 22 geographic areas where each area defined covered at least 10 narratives and which all would include the word snake within their titles. And we have confidence in this data as it was used in other studies. And I've referred to these studies in my other videos, including those on the origin of the flood myth, the origin of the creation myth and the origin of the dragon myth. And overall, we found that the data showed that these myths tended to travel with human migrations and change slowly unless they were impacted by a large cultural shift such as an invasion or colonization. And so knowing this, we should have confidence of being able to reconstruct the mythological narratives of the Paleolithic Europeans. And so how do we interpret the headless snake? Well, this decapitated snake at the bottom of a cave could represent the symbolic neutralization of the dragon. We see such myths endure throughout time from ancient Mesopotamia during the Babylonian Empire where we see a ritual of Marduk's fight against Tiamat every new year and this is in a ritual called the Atiku a fight where the dragon is killed to create the world and this is discussed by Fontenrose who also writes of a very similar ritual and reenactment of that ritual from ancient Egypt. And we see in Japan a ritual remembering of the killing of the dragon by Suzeno, their storm god, being formed in Japanese villages. And until recently, there were many cultures in Western Europe who used to have processions featuring dragons who were either tamed or killed by a saint or heroic warrior. But on their own, these do not prove the Paleolithic ritual or mythology, going from a snake to a dragon and it being enacted out. In effect, we see that humans act out dragon slayer mythology and have done so in terms of the literary record for thousands of years. And I'm not going to cover the origins of the dragon motif in this video. I've already discussed these in my Origins of the Dragons video alongside how phylogenetics was used to reach its conclusions. And so please watch that after these videos, if you haven't seen them, to understand where this myth comes from and how it evolved. But what we can say that from the resultant data, from the analysis, it came to the following conclusion about the beliefs of the dragon and snake mythologies in Europe in the Paleolithic period, and that is that a majority of myths showed that Paleolithic people believed that the course of a river follows a snake's path, the snake would pluck a bird's tail feathers in revenge for the bird eating mosquitoes, the snake has immortality through shedding skin. The snake causes the first person's death. The snake becomes immortal. The snake can fly and produce rain. The snake is a giant animal, a giant snake. The snake has horns. The snake possesses a valuable item which man must take. The snake forms a bridge over a river. The snake forms a rainbow and a snake gives access to water in exchange for valuable items. The snake also fights a giant bird. The snake can resurrect itself and a small being can become gigantic after eating. And finally, in these myths, a woman is forced to marry a snake. Now these motifs are different to those discussed in the Dragon Origins video due to the focus of this work on Paleolithic Europe. And so we see traits such as the horned serpent and immortality become more significant, at least a 50% chance of appearing in myths, traits we don't see globally. And so we can use this to reconstruct proto-folklore and so give valuable information on understanding the remains discovered in the caves, which will help us understand any ritual act. And at first, the Paleolithic Europeans would have used a 
real creature to symbolically represent a mythological creature. Second, that the snake's link with water in the caves could be explained by connection of dragons and water, such that the dragons of myths retain or produce water, which makes them the mediator between water and men. And finally, that the decapitation of the animal would be explained within statistical reconstruction in the myth, and in doing so, would confirm how dangerous the snake was perceived to be. Now, to conclude the mythological part of this study, two European proto-mythologies can be reconstructed. And these are, of course, not identical, which is normal, as they were built using two different databases. However, they are very similar. And so, let me tell you these two proto-myths, and then I'll also tell alongside this two supporting mythologies. And then from here, we can make a decision on whether we feel this myth is appropriate to the ritual. So the first myth goes, the dragon guards the springs, large, scaly, with human hair on its head, and it flies into the sky when both the sun is out and it is raining. And when this happens, the dragon forms a rainbow. But if attacked to make it rain, the dragon will become angry and will produce winds, storms and even thunder and lightning. And then, when it returns to the ground, it would have gained immortality. And then it would unleash the floods to destroy the land. Now the other myth, this the second one we recreated, goes as follows. The dragon is a giant snake possessing many heads, one of which is human and allows it to speak and understand us. Its body is snake-like and covered with scales, and you'll often find it living in the water, although it will venture away from there when searching for food or treasure. When it leaves the water, you will find it in caves or under the ground, but you should not approach it, for it is dangerous and aggressive. It needs human sacrifices to keep it appeased, and the only way to defeat this dragon is through trickery, and then, when the time is right, to chop off its heads. These myths are corroborated by another reconstruction based on another corpus, which is built around the hero's fight against the dragon. At the time of this myth's emergence, probably in the Upper Paleolithic from Southwest Asia, this story would have taken this form. The dragon lives in the sea and is gigantic and snake-like. It is the wind and the storm, the flood and the drought, the plague and the famine. It steals, it kills, and wages war on those around it, ravaging the country of all its vegetation. The god of the storms, or of the sky, must come to fight him, using his favourite and most awesome weapon. And with this, he shoots down the dragon. The fight is hard, and the god is almost beaten, but the enemy is finally defeated and punished. Sometimes... He is imprisoned in the world below or under a mountain. Sometimes his body is mutilated and exposed for all to see. And I'll finish off these myths with a later version of the myth, very much focused on European motifs. And this would have probably been told just after the last Ice Age in a form that is as such. A gigantic dragon, vicious and dangerous with multiple heads, arms and legs, prevents us from accessing water, blocking rivers, containing the seas. He also asks for a human sacrifice, preferably a woman. A hero, using his best weapon, shoots down the enemy. The fight is difficult because the enemy is so large and powerful, but the hero is helped in his fight by his wife who comes to his side. The death of the dragon ensues, and the heroes are celebrated by everyone, men and gods, through great festivities. And so, these myths show a dragon must be defeated to access water and to protect the people, and thus the Paleolithic headless snakes could be left in caves to keep track of ancient rituals and so to master the water. And perhaps there was the fighting of a mythical snake in the ritual. And this hypothesis fits well with the probable existence of 
source rights, rights to water during the European Upper Paleolithic period, especially as we see numerous caves located in the immediate vicinity where these snakes were found. These caves had springs, some thermal and others mineral, and most of which contain ornate decoration in the form of paintings and other art forms. And this all means that the snake remains allude to Paleolithic mythological reconstruction taking place in ritual. But we now need to ask ourselves if the archaeological evidence could provide further evidence for this myth and the proving of the ritual. Well, as I mentioned earlier, within the cave at Les Duc de Audubon, there are a number of cave paintings, and here around 30% of the bison represented on the walls of the cave are headless, and 17% of them are shown with arrow markings or angular signs suggesting they were being killed by arrows. There is only one lion picture in the cave, and that is represented as a headless animal, and this also has an angular sign on the chest, representative of the arrow. And conversely, no horse or ibex picture has been associated with either decapitation or being shot by an arrows. It seems like the animals shot by arrows or headless are both rarely hunted, but were also probably particularly dangerous to hunt. And so to combat these specific traits, the ritual acts of decapitation could have been used to try and prevent those species of animals from being so aggressive, or to inflict harm to all of them, or maybe a more primitive thought of just making one creature inanimate may have made or rendered all of those creatures inanimate. Indeed, a headless creature is a dead creature, and so having seen paintings and clay depictions of animals in this state, then the application of this ritual to the snake could have been done to cause a similar effect, to neutralise the animal. It must also be acknowledged, though, that the cave paintings also reflect a decapitation within the mythology. Now, there's been an important archaeological find in a cave in Medellin in the Dordogne region of France, and it is a perforated stick made of reindeer antler and dated to the middle Magdalenian, which is about 17 to 12,000 years ago. And here we see a sketch depicting a man or woman without clothing, walking and carrying a stick. It is taken from an allegorial group where we see this traveller followed by a snake or conga, while symbolic horse heads seem to be coming to meet him. And there are two buffalo heads are also represented, but on the other side of the stick, uh, without overlapping onto the snake scene, and so we can exclude these from this scene's analysis. Now, André Leroy Gurhan notes that the tail of the serpent on this ends with barbs, which he has interpreted as a male character symbol, but it could also be considered as an appendage of a mythical animal. But what we also know about this is that this stick was once coloured with orca, a red colouring which implies it contained mythical qualities. But to support our analysis about mythology that we made earlier, we should also construct analysis of this image to try and find meaning in it. Now there is a contemporary tale called the Dragon Slayer, which is believed to come from a prehistoric time. And this story tells of how a poor young man gets to the city accompanied by three dogs, and on this day the king's daughter is to be devoured by a many-headed dragon. And this boy, this sort of hero-to-be, fights the monster and cuts off his head and takes evidence of this. Um, normally it's the tongues of the dragons are taken, and then goes off to adventure again, but not without promising the princess that he will return to marry her after a period of time, maybe a year. Now, during his time away, an imposter tries to take credit for the hero's exploits and is about to marry the princess instead. But he is unmasked by the hero just before the marriage ceremony and everybody lives happily ever after, except for the imposter and the dragon, who both probably die. Now, in light of these stories, the perforated stick from the Maedeline could represent the fight between a mythical snake and a man. 
Yes, the snake only has one head here. However, a multi-headed snake is found on another perforated stick discovered in the Megis shelter where we see three entwined snakes with three distinct heads. And such a configuration of snakes can mean multiple heads with one body and so enforce the mythological existence of such a multi-headed snake in the Upper Paleolithic period. But if we go back to the original image, we also see that the man has a stick on his shoulder, which could look like a weapon. And he is turning away from the snake, which is on its back. And so we could assume that the snake here has just been killed. And this implies the snake has been struck with the stick, which is analogous to the storm god striking the dragon with lightning. Much research has been carried out on this analogy and much support suggests that it is like Indra striking Vutra. And that imagery itself could have well developed from the image of a man using a stick to kill the dragon. Now elsewhere in the folklore, the hero is often helped by wild animals to kill the dragon. And versions of the story such as the Bas Britagni number 10 and Basque version number 31, alongside a similar story in a different part of the Arna Thompson Uther Index, known as Rain number 7, often have horses. And occasionally a horse that offers himself as a steed or even fights alongside the human and contributes to the decapitation of one of the dragon's heads. Now, this warrior horse motif is surprising in this mythological context as dogs would seem to fulfil this role of helping against the beast a lot better than a horse. But this could be explained by the role of horses in this area. The age of this motif is particularly corroborated by the attributes of the Gaelic god or Celtic god Taranis, a storm god where he triumphs over an aquiped. And in this myth, Taranis is usually featured as a horseman. However, we do see an unusual situation where the angry pid is crushed by two horses led by the god riding in a chariot. And the ancient scene is shown from the time of King Philip II of Macedon, where you can clearly see on the reverse of one of his coins, Taranis steed resting his foot on the head of a Chthonian monster. This reflects a couple of passages of the Rig Raiders as well, where the injury is said to drive such a chariot pulled by two horses that helped him over the throw of Vutra. And so, like the motif of the passive snake, that of the warrior horse seems to be very old. We even see an example in Ireland in the account of Cuculain's death from the book The Tain, where uh, it has aspects of Indo-European creation myth within it. So we know these are stories based on some very old mythology. But it also shows one of the horses in his chariot, the Grey of Massa, actively fighting against the enemies of his master. And we see within these tales that Conal Kernach has a fighting horse as well. And so if we put all this together and look at this stick from Madeleine, it is possible to propose the existence of a mythological story going back to the Upper Paleolithic where a hero would confront, using horses, a mythical snake, sometimes perhaps a multi-headed snake, and to strike it, to kill it, and then to decapitate it. The beheading of the monster is, is a must. It, it, certainly if we look at the folk tales we've talked about, it's always in there. And similarly, when Vitra is killed, Indra asks a carpenter who is passing to cut off the head of Vitra. However, the snake of the uh, Magdalene is not always headless, unlike skeletons found at the bottom of the caves we've been talking about. And so perhaps this is representing the event after the death, but before the decapitation. Now, another feature of the mythology across Europe and indeed Eurasia is the retention of water by the dragon. This belief seems to have existed in the Paleolithic period and indeed on the stick found in the mega shelter there are three birds identified as swans and swans can be considered makers of the aquatic environment and we also see indications on some of these pictures that the snake is close to water with some considering 
that some of the markings can be interpreted as images of fish. And so, do we have a myth here from the Upper Paleolithic period of a story where a man manages to kill and decapitate a dragon with the help of horses to gain access to water? Well, what we can do is answer what the snake skeletons in Montespan and Les Tuk, the other Burr caves, represent. Is it the story of a fight against a gigantic mythical dangerous snake and gaining access to water? Well, we have shown a number of ways this conclusion could be reconstructed, first through statistical tools and phylogenetics, based on mythology, and then through the observation of archaeological remains, certainly compared with current mythology. Now, the creatures whose remains were discovered in Montespan and Les Tuk de Odebur do lend themselves well to the mythology. The snake, the appearance of which may refer to a mythical serpent, the archaeological context, the presence of snakes near an underground river. This again lends itself to the mythology as well. We have shown empirically and statistically that the snake as an imaginary creature had every chance to be linked to water. But additionally to this, we have shown that the men at the time considered it a dangerous animal, and not just because it was a snake, but because of what it represented. The presence of a headless serpent in the depths of the earth where water is born can be explained if he was considered to be the guardian of the source of the water. That would explain the choice of the two caves from which the rivers flow. The position of the headless snakes would then be a remnant of a ritual for the liberation of the waters. What we have in these caves then is the remains of a dragon slaying ritual and the memory of this ritual which can be reconstructed even today 17,000 years later. And I would like to thank my patrons for their support in making this video possible. Please check out The Origin of the Dragon Myth if you haven't seen it yet. And please ask questions in the comments below. And I hope you really enjoyed that. And so to all of you, please stay safe and stay well. And this was Crack and Fault.